Hello, greetings. Today, we are talking about this test setup. These are components from Sven Sven is a good acquaintance to whom I sent a clone of the 7i92 at some point. Now he has reached out to me asking for help because he can't get the components to work. He sent me a package and it contains a mini PC with Linux CNC installed and a small machine configuration, the clone of the 7i92, a Benazon breakout board, and a Mesa 7i84. Now let's put everything together and I'll take you along on the journey. I'll share some information, as the breakout board is something that some of you may still have in the drawer, or perhaps even in use. That's why I'm publishing this documentation. As mentioned, it's a breakout board that was originally powered through the parallel interface, and you could connect four stepper motor drivers, or four motor drivers that respond to step and direction signals. It has an analog output, 0 to 10 volts, two relays, an input for the emergency stop button, and four inputs for the limit switches or reference switches for X, Y, Z, and A. On the board, using jumper wires, you have the option to redirect the actual signals coming through the parallel interface to a different function. This is a rough description of the Benizen breakout board. As you can see, I've already made some connections, and now let's dive into the details. As mentioned, the 7i92, or its clone, receives five volts from the computer, through the USB interface. However, these five volts also go to this breakout board, and this breakout board has an input for 12 or 24 volts. I have supplied it with 24 volts because the 7i84 also requires 24 volts, and to power the small JMC motor here, it also needs 24 volts. Let's jump into the 7i92, specifically into the bit file. There is a Benazon bit file for the 7i92, which I used, but I modified it, and created a new one. However, you don't have to do this. You can flash the original bit file and get a configuration of special functions on one of the two connectors. This means two PWM signals. In the original Benazon bit file, it's a single PWM, always the first one, I believe, being routed to two different pins. However, I created two of them just to have more variability. Then, I have all the step generators, and if you pay close attention, you'll see a fifth step generator here. Even though I only have four axes, I have a fifth step generator. You should know that this board was originally operated on the parallel interface. For those who might still remember, when the PC booted up with a parallel interface, individual pins could change their state. Then, of course, this breakout board interpreted these signals and ran motors or switched valves, whatever. To prevent this, a solution was devised. There is a pin, in this case, pin 16, that sends a square wave signal from the control to this board. Only when this square wave signal arrives does the board become active and process signals. Before that, it ignores all signals. This function can also be turned off. You can say with a jumper that you don't want the function but I implemented it because I think it's actually quite cool, because we never know what happens on the way from the computer here or what signals might sneak in during boot up. And as I said, if the square wave signal is not present, this breakout board does nothing at first. We'll see that shortly. Hence, the additional step generator. The bit file I have now contains, so to speak, four smart serial channels and three encoders on the second pin header. I included the encoders as a precautionary measure in case Sven wants to use them. The smart serials are added because he has already connected the 7i84. Now, for example, he could also add a TSHW board and still have two channels that he can lead out from the pin header here. So, smart serials, I have now connected two channels via this small interface board to the 7i84. That concludes the discussion on the 7i92. Now let's take a look at the HAL file. I made some adjustments to his configuration and added some things. First, I modified the configuration lines of the HostMod 2 driver. I added three encoders, one PWM generator, and five step generators. Then I continued, I added something for this charge pump, that is for this square wave signal, 10 kilohertz. I assigned fixed values to the last step generator. The important thing is the step type two, 
and this gives you a nice square wave signal. As mentioned, I set the values to 10 kHz, and the step generator becomes active when the machine is activated through the interface. Then the square wave signal comes out, and this breakout board becomes active. Initially, this has nothing to do with the emergency stop button. The emergency stop button is connected through an input. This means this emergency stop button goes through an input, through the 7i92 into Linux CNC, and we can see that here. It comes through GPIO 14, and up here we already see the GPIOs for homing, i.e. Uh, the limit switches. I can dampen that right away so that we can see everything is working. Then there's the part with the relays. One relay is configured to switch when I send the PWM signal for this analog part, and it is greater than 10%. Then the relay switches, and if it is less than 10%, the relay stops switching again. This happens because there are not enough pins. The other relay is connected to a pin. I have to check. It is GPIO 0 well 1, which I can activate and deactivate. As mentioned, the other relay is now configured to respond to PWM. This means that if the spindle receives an analog value above 10%, this relay switches on. It used to be different in the past. Back then, there were too few GPIOs through the parallel interface, i.e., too few inputs and outputs. Now, we have basically covered everything. We described GPIO 7. I haven't explained GPIO 007 yet. This is the enable signal and I have linked it to the machine enable. When the machine is enabled, GPIO 007 becomes active and all amplifiers are activated. On the amplifiers, we have the enable signal, which is derived from here, and it applies globally to all amplifiers. Okay, now we're through. Let's look at the PWM and analog below for those who are interested. So, I adopted the PWM scale from the INI and set the variable max speed fixed at 24,000. This means the PWM scale is simply 24,000. I have already shown this in several videos. If I now link the programmed spindle speed with the absolute value, in this case the value of 24,000 revolutions in S, so S equals 24,000, then that corresponds to 100% PWM, which should be exactly 10 volts. If I then program 12,000 revolutions, it should correspond to 5 volts, so half, 50%, so to speak. To ensure that the enable signal is only active when the spindle is also turned on, I have connected the spindle enable signal network with the enable pin of the PWM generator. This means that when the signal spindle.00 on is active, the PWM generator is also automatically active and provides me with the analog signal. So far, we're through in the HL, the rest is standard. I won't go into that now. Let's test the whole thing start the machine, and should expect to have an emergency stop. That means emergency stop is displayed below, and I can't clear it either. I can press as much as I want. I can try to press F1 here. It doesn't work, because the whole thing is linked in such a way that the emergency stop must be lifted first. First, we see two red LEDs here, indicating that an emergency stop is active on the emergency stop input, and we also have an emergency stop on the motor amplifiers. To take the motor amplifiers out of the emergency stop mode, I have inserted plugs with a small bridge here. I plug them into the connectors for Y and Z, and for X, I connect my motor. Now we see that one of the red LEDs has gone out. This means that all three motors, X, Y, and Z, are okay. Why is this not the case with A? For A, there is a jumper. Since A is an optional axis, this function can be bridged and deactivated on this A axis. X, Y, and Z are present in most cases. But as I said, you can simulate this function by setting a small bridge here. The next emergency stop would be the button here. If I now release this button, we can already see that the emergency stop has disappeared. Now I can turn on the machine, and now I can also see the second green LED here, which comes on immediately. When I press the switch, this square wave signal, the charge pump, becomes active. When I press enable, the charge pump comes on here. We take the charge pump, still have one pin, the enable pin. Now I can turn the motor freely. But when the machine is turned on, I cannot turn it because it is then under control. So the motor becomes stiff. And I can no longer turn it. I will reference everything and suggest that we now focus on the X-axis. 
I don't know if you can see it, but the motor rotates both to the left and to the right. We can let it spin faster and then back again. So, it works. I have tried this with each axis, and it works smoothly. That means the step direction signals are coming through correctly. Now I want to show you the homing switches. To do this, I'll open the HAL meter, and up here, you can see the homing switches. This means I'll take my jumper wire now and simulate the first homing switch. You can see, X is working. Let's take the next one, Y, Z, and the A reference switch. It works too. Okay, the function of the reference switches is also fine. Now I want to test the spindles. We turn on the multimeter, and I'll say S24000 now. Now we see here that 24,000 is programmed, and I switch to M3. We see here, the relay has engaged. As I said, if it's over 10%, the relay engages. We see here 10 volts, and we said, if we program half of the spindle speed, so 12,000, then 5 volts should come out. For me, half would be S12,000, and we see it's 5 volts here. So I can control an HF spindle very well here. The frequency converter then receives 0 to 10 volts. If I now go below 10%, that means 1500 would still be over 10%. 0, 6 volts, and 1100 should already drop the relay. We see the relay has gone off at 1200, 1250, 1300, at about 1300, approximately 10%, the relay goes on again. As I said, this is a special function described here. Because with the use of analog, the direct control of the relay via pin is usually eliminated. So that it somehow retains its function, you can redirect the PWM signal to go to the analog part and additionally drive this relay. I find it a nice thing, otherwise the relay would be pointless in this configuration case. It would have no function. Okay, let's do 12,000 again, 5 volts, and we say M5 to turn it off. Now I have another relay that I can control to simply turn the coolant on and off. So it makes sense to turn on the spindle, and now I want to activate the cooling with M8. We can thus add the cooling here. Alternatively, I could use the relay not for cooling, but for example, link it to changes in direction of rotation. After going through this, I could now test the emergency stop system again. The emergency stop works, so we see everything is configured as desired, and I cannot deactivate the emergency stop. The motor is also released. Only when I take back the emergency stop and turn on the machine here again, everything is active again. We can test it again if a motor fails here. That means if you disconnect a cable here, the emergency stop is also activated. This function is already active as well. Now we only have the 7i84 left. As mentioned earlier, it is already connected and we can already see it in the structure here with pin 7i92, 7i84. I have already selected input zero here and will demonstrate it to you. So, I take 24 volts plus and go to the first input and then it becomes active. So, I can dampen it, take it away, dampen it, take it away. This is just to make sure that the card is also integrated and functioning. Okay, I'm thinking for a moment if I have all the functions now. I think so. As you can see, you can easily control an old breakout board originally intended for the parallel interface with a 7i92, 5i25, or 6i25 from Mesa. You could even do it with a 7i96s, as we also have an additional bar there where you could connect such a breakout board. It's not a problem. You just need the appropriate bit file so that the pins at the respective location or certain pins receive a special function.
I think I can hand over the whole thing to Sven, as it is. With this, he can now develop his configuration, install it neatly in a cabinet, and then put the CNC mill into operation without any problems, I would say. All right, at this point, I would like to say, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. That's free. Activate the bell so you don't miss the next video. If you'd like to support me further, you can do so on Patreon. At this point, I say goodbye and until the next video.